Hey, thank you. Wow. I am so happy to be here. Thank you, guys. And I know a lot of you guys were waiting out in the rain for a long time to get in, so thank you for being patient and thank you for being with me tonight. I'm so happy to be back in D.C. Well, I wonder how many demigods we have out there, huh? All right. So that means a lot of you parents must actually be Olympian gods. Okay. Good, because otherwise it would just be awkward. That's good. Well, as you know, we're here tonight to celebrate the new book, and I am so excited about it. The House of Hades. Or as one of my fans online redesigned it, the House Party of Hades. I'm really not sure who did that, but they had a lot of spare time on their hands. People always ask me, how did you become a writer? They've heard stories that writers always have to suffer and they have terrible lives and horrible stories about their families in order to be creative. So I thought I'd give you a little background on how I became a writer and my horrible life. Oh, as a child, I was so miserable. I never smiled. Oh, it's horrible. There's me at Christmas with my little Ricky stocking. Nobody loved me. It was horrible. <laughs> That's my mom on the left and my uncle on the right. I'm sitting on my grandfather's lap. Everybody called him the colonel because he was an Air Force colonel in World War II. And when I was a little older than that, he used to sit me on his lap. He had this briefcase full of blank paper, and he would take out the paper, and he would draw pictures for me and make up stories off the top of his head. It was like magic. And someday I said to myself, I want to be able to do that. My parents were also great storytellers. They had all kinds of great things to tell me. My, my dad, wonderful role model. Uh, we did all sorts of vigorous, manly activities together. <laughs> this was our favorite sport. It, I'm still pretty good at it. But he also read me my first book of mythology, Tall Tales from, from the West. My mother was an art teacher in the public school. She gave me my impeccable fashion sense. And she used to take me to the public swimming pool so I could show off my fashion and impress the ladies. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty much rocking the hat. Yeah. She got me my first car as well. Uh, that, by the way, was a, a picture of an amusement park that my grandfather owned. He designed and made all the amusement rides. So having one grandfather that was a storyteller and another one that made amusement park rides, pretty sweet deal. <laughs> uh, but then, you know, they told me that someday I would grow up and have to read for myself. And I really wasn't as excited about that. I said, no way, I'm out of here. <laughs> Hit the street at an early age. No, actually, I, I stuck around, but I wasn't nearly as good-looking when I hit adolescence. About sixth grade, things got rough. There's me. <laughs> yeah, I was very self-conscious. I was a very pudgy child, and I didn't like to go out into the wild, but my parents loved to make me do things outdoors like camping. I hated it. About the only thing I liked was animals. I, I, I did enjoy that. Here's me communing with a rooster. <laughs> I didn't do much reading back then. About the only thing that I enjoyed reading were just, was the stuff I wasn't supposed to read. My uncles had a fantastic collection of old comic books. Here are a couple of the ones that I read when I was a kid. And you'll notice, here's Superman being turned into a lion by a villain named Circe. Hmm. And over here, we have the mighty Thor, who is, of course, the god of thunder, and his dad, Odin. And I didn't know that these stories were thousands of years old, but I sure loved them as comic books. I would have been fine reading this stuff, and elementary school wasn't too terrible, but then something horrible happened to me. It was called middle school. <laughs> there are my teachers from middle school. Can you tell why I have no trouble believing that middle school teachers could actually be monsters? <laughs> The guy up there on the second row, Mr. Fielder, he was our band director. He was this chain-smoking disco dude. He always had these leisure suits. The guy on the bottom in the corner there, Mr. Phelps, he was my history teacher. I was pretty sure he was an android. <laughs> 
He had no expressions. That's about the only time I ever saw him smile was in that picture. And he would always speak in a monotone, like, please turn in your homework now. Exterminate! Exterminate! <laughs> the only thing scarier than the teachers was the students. There's my class, yeah. Little did I know that my future wife was in my eighth grade class. I know, right? That's Becky right there. And this is actually her junior school yearbook. You notice how she wrote Foxy next to that guy? That's not me. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, no, nobody wrote Foxy next to mine. I don't know why. The only, about the only thing that I liked about middle school, I, I really, I just had a terrible middle school experience. And the only thing I liked is, is retreating from reality. But the problem was, back in 1978, there weren't that many ways to retreat from reality. We didn't have smartphones. We didn't have the internet. No social media, email, cable TV, videos, video games. Forget it. None of that. I mean, okay, I had one video game. Pong. Beep, beep. And that's it. There were really two options. I mean, either you could go outside, which I hated, or you could read, which I also hated. But I did find one series of books that I liked. It was enough like the comic books. It was called The Lord of the Rings. That was pretty cool. And then I found out that one of the English teachers at my middle school had done her master's thesis on the Lord of the Rings. And I said, wow, she's got to be the coolest teacher ever. I have to get into her class. Unfortunately, she taught honors English, and nobody was ever going to put me in honors English. I tried anyway. I went up to my regular English teacher, and I said, I really want to get into Mrs. Paps's class. My teacher looked at me. I'm not sure she knew who I was. She was like, well, okay, we'll give you a test today and we'll see how you do in class. So that day in class, my teacher called on me for the very first time. She said, uh, <clears throat> Ricky, that's what they called me, can you explain to the class what irony is? I blanked. I was like, irony is the fact that I can't think of the definition of irony right now. <laughs> Fortunately, she bought it and I got into honors English. And there's Mrs. Pabst. She was a wonderful teacher. She turned me into a writer. I wrote a story for her. She helped me to submit it to a magazine. It wasn't published, but that really gave me the itch for creative writing. From there, I got into the Norse myth. She said, Rick, if you like the Lord of the Rings, you really got to check out the Norse dudes. They're awesome. Odin, who had his eye plucked out for the gift of knowledge. Loki, who was the god of treachery and backstabbing and all kinds of fun stuff. And, of course, Thor, who not only had a really cool hammer, but he had recyclable goats. <laughs> he could kill them every night, stew them up, eat them for dinner, and the next morning they would come right back to life. Which is great, I guess, if you like goat meat. <laughs> From the Norse gods, I got into the Greek and Roman gods. Now, in high school, they didn't have any kind of mythology class, but they did have Latin class. And so I got into that. And I know you're thinking, Rick, could your hair possibly have gotten any longer in high school? Why, yes. <laughs> yes, it could. Here's a picture of my journal from high school when I was a freshman. I was reading this the other day, and along with the regular embarrassing stuff, like which girls I liked, I also mention in this journal entry that I'm looking forward to being freed at the end of the six weeks. Now, I didn't remember what that meant, and then I was like, oh my god, I forgot about that. We had a slave auction in Latin. I'm serious. They would take the freshmen, and they would have this huge party. All the upperclassmen would bid on you and they would buy you as a slave for six weeks. I know you couldn't get away with that now, right? But I had to like be this guy's slave and every day he's a slave, bring me cookies, you know, and it was horrible. And I would also sign every journal entry, chaos ex ordo, which is Latin for chaos from order, which tells you something about what kind of guy I was. I was a troublemaker. <laughs> 
I got kicked out of so many classes. I never read a single book that was assigned to me in high school. Not one. I had an underground newspaper that I ran off at the school's expense without them knowing about it, in which I made fun of the teachers, the principal, the football team, just about everything. I got kicked out of history. I got kicked out of marching band. I probably would have been kicked out of school, except one thing kept me in high school, and that was a girl. I met Becky, who would later on become my wife, and she really was sort of like Annabeth to Percy. I mean, you know if you've read the books, Percy is kind of a bonehead. Well, yeah. And he needs Annabeth to remind him what's going on and slap him around once in a while. And that's, Annabeth is very much based on Becky. And so she kept me interested in school, and we went on to college together. By this time, I still wasn't getting published. I was ready to give up. And I decided, okay, in college, I'll do the other thing I love. I'll just get into music. And that's what I did in college. And you're thinking, Rick, could your hair possibly have gotten any longer? <laughs> yes. Yes, it could. <laughs> My son Patrick looked at this the other day and said, yeah, Dad, that's when you were cool. God. <laughs> I was in a band. That was my job in college. I worked my way through school. That way we were terrible. I found our demo tape about a week ago. I was thinking about putting it on iTunes, but I was afraid I would break the internet. <laughs> Fortunately, I gave up on my dreams of being a musician, and two good things happened while I was in college. The first was Becky and I got married, and that was awesome. You're wondering why are there candles on our wedding cake? Well, that's because Becky and I have the same birthday. She's 30 minutes older than I am. We got married on our mutual 21st birthday, so I would never forget my anniversary. <laughs> And we've been married ever since. The other good thing that happened is I got a degree in teaching. I got credentialed in English and history, and I had to cut my hair. Yay. I love being a teacher. It was so much fun. I taught for 15 years. There's me in my classroom. I taught everything from fourth grade to 12th grade. Most of my time was in middle school, and I tried to make my classes fun. That's a picture of me with my sixth grade. We were studying Korea, so I figured, well, hey, let's invite the local Taekwondo team to come down and teach us some moves. They did. They wanted to break a board over my head. I said no. <laughs> When we studied Shakespeare with the eighth graders, we brought stage actors out and taught everybody how to do combat fencing. So they all had rapiers, and the kids were out on the tennis court fighting. It was really cool. And of course, when we studied Greek mythology, all the kids dressed up, wrote these little prayers to the gods, and went out to the barbecue pit, fired it up, and we did burnt sacrifices. I can't believe they let me get away with that, but they did. By the way, if you ever think about sacrifice, Sacrificing to Aphrodite, burning Barbie dolls smell really bad. <laughs> I'm just saying. Another funny thing happened in middle school. I don't know why, but as I was teaching middle schoolers, I suddenly just got the desire to contemplate murder. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> No, really, I was just reading a bunch of mystery novels, and I, I really enjoyed that. So I decided to write my first book, but it was a private eye novel for adults, and it was called Big Red Tequila. <laughs> Everything in Texas is bigger, even murder. My students said, Mr. Riordan, you wrote a book? Can we read it? I said, no. <laughs> It's not appropriate. There's bad language and violence. And they said, cool. <laughs> so they all went out and bought it. One day, this kid came up to me with a gleam in his eye. He had the book, and he was like, Mr. Riordan, do you know that you used the F word 54 times? <laughs> he was so thrilled. He'd gone through and highlighted them. I told him it was actually 55. Go back and recount. I did lots of these books while I was teaching full-time. This one was one of my favorite. It's called The Devil Went Down to Austin. This is my one and only scuba diving adventure. I, I, don't, I didn't know anything about scuba diving, but I took lessons in Austin, and I went down into this lake to check it out. One day, my instructor said, all right, Rick, you're ready. Tomorrow, we go down into the lake. Be sure and bring hot dogs. 
I was like, why? Don't ask. Just bring hot dogs. I was terrified. I had my package of Oscar Mayer wieners the next day. I put on my scuba deer and down we went to the bottom of the lake and I found out why you need hot dogs in Lake Travis. There are these catfish that are like this long. And you take the hot dogs and you, you feed them to the catfish and the mouths on these things, they're like, hot I guess if you don't bring hot dogs, they eat your face or something. But I love this, but you might be thinking, well, if, if you were a novelist, you were published, why didn't you quit your day job? Obviously, you were rich and famous. Well, not so much, no. Uh, let me put it this way. How many, how many books do you think you read uh, last year? Like an average number of books. How many books do you read? Anybody want to uh, throw out a number? Yeah, in the glasses, third row. Yeah. 20,000? That would be impressive. Yes. Yeah. I'd say about... Uh, About wow, five hundred. That would be like ten a day. Dang, that's pretty good on the aisle right there. Yeah. Um, at least, like, I read very. I read a lot. You read a lot. I, I don't even know a number, but it's probably. A, at least 200. Okay, could be. Well, the average number that an American adult reads during a year is 15. Yeah. So some of you are, are bringing up the average. And in fact, 40% of adults read no books during the year. Yeah, I know. Now, how many books, different question, how many different titles, new books, do you think are published in America in an average year? Anybody want to guess how many different books come out every year? In the white shirt in front, go for it. About 70? Okay. And, and over here, what do you think? 20 or 30. Okay, what do you think? About 25. You might be surprised. The actual number is 328,000. Yeah, so if you're a writer, what's the chance that your new book is going to be one of the 15 that people are going to read? Not very good. So you're thinking, though, oh, well, okay, fine, but, you know, books are expensive, so you get money from every book, right? Every hardcover, if you, like, bought a hardcover tonight, it's like, what, 20 bucks, right? So, so every time you buy a book, I get 20 bucks? No. Not so much. No, no. Actually, uh, I only get a fraction of that. Anyone want to guess what the author makes if you're, if you're doing that for $20? And the, uh, let's see, right there on the corner, yes, in the second row. Uh-huh. A fourth, 25%, I would take that. Actually, 10%. So if you buy it for 20, I get about two bucks. So how many would you have to sell to get rich and famous? A lot, right? Now, they do give you money up front. When you publish a book, they sort of take their best guess. Okay, how much do we think he's going to make? What's going to be his cut? Well, when Big Red Tequila came out, my first book, I'll be honest, my, my advance was $15,000. Which, hey, I mean, I was happy to have that. I mean, that's, that's a lot of money, right? But if that's your whole salary for a year and you have a family of four, that puts you under the poverty line. So bottom line is I, I did not quit my day job. Yay. Yeah. But I love teaching, and that was fine with me. I got a, a reputation for doing crazy things in my classroom. I would dress up. Here's me as Colonial Rick. <laughs> I know, right? I'm rocking it. Here's me when we did Japan as Samurai Rick. And I also love telling stories. I would tell the myths. I would tell histor historical stories. I would tell all kinds of different stories. Um, and I got kind of a reputation for it. Not everybody liked it. In fact, my son Patrick, uh, he was at that school that I taught at, and I went to his class so many times. They had this mystery writer, like, readers program. You know, like, you go to the library, and the teacher's like, okay, everybody, we have a special guest today. Everybody close your eyes. So they closed their eyes. I snuck up to the front, and the teacher goes, Okay, open your eyes. Surprise! This girl in the front went, I knew it was going to be him again. <laughs> Most people like my stories, though. That's me being a uh, Medusa victim. And they always said, Mr. Riordan, why don't you write these down? You should tell stories for kids and, and make books. I said, well, I don't know what to do. I mean, I, I don't know what to write about. And then a funny thing happened. I had kids of my own. 1994, my first son was born. 
Ah, I know. He doesn't look like that anymore. Yeah. yeah. Now, we named him Haley. And I know you're thinking, Haley, that's, that's a girl's name, isn't it? But Haley actually is an Irish boy's name that, that means ingenious. But like a lot of Irish boy's names, like Riley and Carrie and Kelly, it kind of got turned into a girl's name. We had no idea that in 1994, when he was born, that that year, Haley would become the most popular girl's name of all time. So... <laughs> Sorry, buddy, but he, you know, he's, he's pretty easygoing. He didn't really care. I read a lot to Haley when he was young, and I wanted him to like books more than I did. Unfortunately, Haley was kind of a troublemaker. He doesn't look like a troublemaker, right? Oh, he was. He was totally ADHD, like his dad. I remember one time when he was about this age, we had this furnace grate on the floor of our place. And one time, Haley had this bowl of Cheerios, and he walked up to it, and he accidentally spilled some in, and they caught fire. <laughs> There were flames leaping up from the depths of Tartarus, right? And he was, like, looking down there, and his mom and I were running around screaming. I got the fire hydrant, and we were, like, spraying everything, smoke billowing up, running around. Ah! 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 And he was like, cool. He decided he wanted to see it again. The next day, he found a bucket of clean laundry. Went over to the grate, dumped it on. Went over to the thermostat and turned it to a hundred. <laughs> Becky and I come in, flames are leaping up, the laundry's smoking, we're like, ah, spraying it down. That's the kind of kid he was, real easy. Yeah. I'm afraid it only got worse when he got to school. Haley was not really good with school. He didn't like that. There's him in his little uniform. Oh, he hated reading. He hated writing. He hated all kinds of homework. Well, it turns out he's dyslexic. So there was a good reason why reading was very hard for him. But that was hard for me as a teacher to have a kid that doesn't like reading. But I mean, I remembered I was like that. So I said, okay, let me tell you some stories uh, to keep you interested in school. We'll just, you know, do bedtime stories at home. Is there anything you like at school? Anything. He said, well, there's this one unit that's not too bad. It's on Greek mythology. This is their wax museum project. They all dressed up as Greek gods, and they had little buttons in front of them, and you would press the button, and they would recite their lines. Haley was Hades. <laughs> So I started telling him stories at home about the Greek gods, but I wanted to mix it up a little bit, so I made them modern. I said, wouldn't it be cool to have Zeus in a pinstripe suit, Poseidon in a Tommy Bahama, and you could have Ares in his biker gear riding around a Harley, you know, on the streets of Colorado. And I had to make up a hero, too. I decided to make my hero ADHD and dyslexic like my son. And I told Haley, you know, if you have those conditions, there's a pretty good chance you're a demigod. <laughs> he was like, yeah. <laughs> and so was born my hero, Peter Johnson. <laughs> No, not really, Percy Jackson. Haley liked the story. My students read it. They liked it. They said, yes, yeah, send this in. Let's get it published. So I sent it off to New York. Right away, an agent decided that she wanted to represent me. And there she is. That's Nancy Galt. And Nancy was really, really enthusiastic. We sent it off to the publishers. Some of the publishers didn't really get it. They read The Lightning Thief. One of them said, there's too much action. <laughs> The, kid, the kids the kid, don't want to read that. It's too long. It's 350 pages. No, no, no. You, you need to split it into three books of about 100 pages and slow it down. Well, we didn't go with that publisher. Fortunately, Disney Hyperion got it right away. And my first editor there was Jennifer Besser. She was awesome. She said, ah, oh, I love this book. Let's do it. Let's talk covers. Now, I'm sure you've heard, don't judge a book by its cover. Yes. Totally not true, right? We all do that. So it's really important to have a good cover. First cover idea for The Lightning Thief. Yeah, not so much. So then they got another artist. Second cover idea for The Lightning Thief. I didn't like this really. It was better, but they decided to clean it up a little bit like this and 
that's the cover that they went with. Now, yeah, and you can still find some old copies of The Lightning Thief that look like that. I still didn't like it, though, and my editor, Jennifer, said, okay, that's fine. If you, if you don't like it, it's not selling that great. And it really wasn't at first. It was not a bestseller right away, not at all. But she said, let's find a new cover artist. And so she found this guy in Brooklyn named John Rocco. And John had never done a book cover before. But he came into her office. He read the book. He said, oh, this is great. Okay, here's what the cover needs to look like. He got out a napkin, and he sketched a, a really quick sketch. We loved it. And we hired him, and that's the cover that he chose. That's the one you know. The funny thing is every country has their own ideas about what will work for people in their country. There's the British cover. <laughs> Their slogan is, half boy, half god, all hero. <laughs> One boy was really upset about that. He said, oh, Mr. Riordan, is that a spoiler? I was like, what do you mean? He said, it says he's half boy. Does that mean he's half girl? <laughs> it's like, no, 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 no. Here's the lightning thief in Korean. Yeah, I wouldn't want to put a nose ring on that guy. <laughs> And the lightning thief in Swedish. Uh, you know, go figure. It never really did very well in Sweden. What is, what is that guy doing? It's like, <laughs> hey, the lightning is streaky egg over here. Like, I don't really get that. <clears throat> Ah, uh, but the Germans, the Germans. Oh, well, first, uh, I have to show you a few really, really low-budget covers. Here's the Ukrainian Percy Jackson. It, it looks like Percy Jackson goes to Candyland. <laughs> and the Romanians. I think the Romanians spent about $10 designing theirs. <laughs> right? Percy Jackson in Hotel Fugle Rudy. And Zeus is like, yes. <laughs> but the Germans really took the cake. I, I heard that the Germans were very serious people, and they liked dark, serious covers. And then I get it, and it's this. <laughs> Nice job. I think the Germans must have heard you guys laughing all the way from America because they finally changed the cover and now it looks uh, much better. It looks like that. Yeah, not bad, not bad. Now, as I said, at this point, you know, I really wasn't sure if anybody would ever read this book. It wasn't doing all that well. Nobody had ever heard about it. Then I got the call that every writer always thinks about and dreams about and wonders about, and that is the call from Hollywood. <laughs> Wait a minute. That's not Hollywood. That's a, that's a train wreck. Hold on. Uh, no, is this still a train wreck? I don't know. Oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah. Sorry, I get those things confused. Anyway, um, <laughs> this agent called me from L.A., a film agent. He was like, hey, good news. We have two offers to option your book for the films. And when he says option, that basically means they put like a down payment on it. And so later on, they can purchase it if they decide that it's worthy of becoming a movie. And I said, well, okay, uh, who are the studios? He said, well, one is Fox 2000, like 20th Century Fox, and the other one is Nickelodeon. And Haley, who was nine years old at the time, said, Nickelodeon, Nickelodeon. But the agent said, well, if you go with Fox, there, there's a slightly better chance that it'll become a movie. And I said, well, when you say slightly better, what do you mean? He said, well, getting optioned in the first place, that's about a 10,000 to 1 chance. If you actually get optioned, then there's maybe a 1 in 20 chance that it will actually become a movie. So the odds were not that great. But I thought about it, and I, I talked to the studio people, and I said, well, if, if, I, if I agree to this, do I get any control? And they were like, oh! <laughs> 
<laughs> get your, no. <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, I was a middle school teacher. I had one book out. Why would I know anything about movies? No, they're not going to trust me with, like, a $40 million movie. Forget it. So I thought about that, and I said, well, mm -hmm, um, okay. So if I say no, um, then I might never get another offer. Nobody might hear about the book, and that's it. If I say yes, I don't have any control, but at least I can go around and say, hey, and this book was also optioned as a movie. Cool. And then everybody might want to buy the book, which is actually what happened. So it did help. But yeah, I didn't have any control. And then they sent me a script like years later when they decided to do the first one. And I read the script. They said, oh, we totally want your input. So I was reading the script and I was like... <laughs> and so I wrote them back and I said, I have a few suggestions. And I pulled out like 20 pages. <laughs> And I said, you know, I don't know that the, the fans of the books will really like it if you change it too much from the book. And they said, oh, that doesn't matter. What? I said, what? No, well, here, you know, here's their reasoning. Here's their reasoning. I mean, I told you 40% of the people never read books anyway, right? So they're like, well, you know, nobody reads books. And, and the ones that do, eh, they'll be fine with it as long as it's a good movie. And most people won't have read it, so it doesn't matter. And I was like, you know, I really don't know that I agree with you. And they said, well, that's the way we're going to do it. And at that point, I said, you know, I don't think I'm going to, I'm going to, I don't think I'm going to see it because I didn't kind of want my ideas of how the characters looked and all the action to be changed. You know how when you see the movie version, that really affects the way that you see the characters? So that's why I just kind of stepped out and I said, okay, I mean, you guys do your thing. Um, and then, so I haven't seen either of the movies, so I, I, I can't tell you much about them. Um, but I do control the books, so I'll just keep trying to do the best I can with those. Anyway. But I, I am grateful that a lot of people heard about the books through the movies, so that, you know, that's awesome. Well, we kept going with the books. The next one was The Sea of Monsters. Of course, the book, not the movie we're talking about. The first cover idea uh, was that. <laughs> And then we decided to go with John Rocco's idea, so it became much different. That. Yeah, not bad. You know, every cover, though, is a real challenge. Um, uh, an example, when we did the graphic novel, the comic version of The Sea of Monsters, they gave me three different examples of how they could do the cover. And these are just sketches, of course, but I really wasn't sure which one I wanted to choose. I decided I liked this one a little bit better, and so they went with that, and the final version looked like that. So that's not bad. Then, of course, the other countries that did the book, they, I, they didn't tell me what they were doing. It just kind of happened. There's the Vietnamese version. There's Italian. The Italians are always so fashionable. I, I, you know, I don't know who that guy is, but he's wearing a hoodie, so he must be cool, right? <laughs> And, of course, the Germans. Yeah. yeah. As Percy boldly surfs into the Cyclops' armpit. Okay. At this point, I had two books. I was still reading them to Haley, my older son, but my younger son, Patrick, wanted nothing to do with it. That was his brother's deal. He didn't want to know about it. He didn't want to hear about it. I said, well, do you want me to tell you some stories of your own? Patrick said, no thanks, Dad. I'm good. <laughs> when he was a little guy, it's not like I didn't read to him. I read to him a lot. There's our favorite book, Everyone Poops. It's a fabulous book. I, I won't tell you how it comes out in the end, but um, he said, no, Dad, I want to tell you stories. And so Patrick did, and we wrote some of them down, and we did some bestsellers together that were great. For instance, The Sand Adventure by Patrick and Rick. And he told me what to write, and then he did the illustrations. Then one day, I was on my way to an author visit at a local school. I was driving Patrick to school on the way. We got to Patrick's school, and they were turning people around because the, the plumbing main had busted, and there was no school. So here I was with my kid in the car on my way to a school visit. I said, well, guess what, buddy? You're going to be my assistant today. So he came to the school visit with me. He heard me do my spiel, and he said, said, oh, that's what you write, Dad? Oh, okay, that's cool. I'll read that. So after that, I had two helpers at home. We went on to the Titan's Curse, the third book, and again, it was really tough to get the cover. John did three sketches for us, very different. There was one. We said, that one looks too much like the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. 
He did one with Thalia and the hunters out in the woods. And we said, yeah, okay, but, and then he did this simple, very simple sketch. We said, ooh, that's cool. And so that is what the Titan's Curse looked like when it came out. Now, the first time I showed this at a school visit, a kid said, Mr. Riordan, why is Percy riding a war moose? <laughs> so, just so we're clear, okay, that's a dude on a war moose. That's a Pegasus. War moose. Pegasus. Okay, good. I don't know. Overseas, I, I like to call this book in the UK Attack of the Ketchup. Mm -hmm. And they changed it now. They, they figured this didn't work so well. So now it looks like that in the UK. Yeah, much better. And at that point, you know, I really thought I was ready to kind of wrap up Percy Jackson. I thought five books is plenty. So I did Battle of the Labyrinth. I did The Last Olympian. And Percy was 16. The prophecy was done. I figured by that time, I'll have covered every Greek myth there is. Well, of course, I was wrong. But I decided to try my hand at some other things. Scholastic Books called, and they said, hey, would you like to do a different series for us? We got this thing going called The 39 Clues. I said, yeah, sure. That was awesome. I, I really enjoyed doing that. And then I decided, hey, why not Ancient Egypt? I always loved those myths, too. And I did The Cain Chronicles. <laughs> Love those. So cool. I mean, if you've read it, you know that a lot of it happens right here in town, and the Washington Monument is like the, the climax of the whole book, and it was so fun to do. And it did great all the way across the world. There was the German cover, <laughs> Korean, Russian, and of course the Italian. Again, so fashionable, it's like, I would totally fight you, but it would mess up my hair. Probably my favorite is the Japanese version. Uh, it looks like a combination of Pokemon and Black Butler or something. And the, the Japanese translator, I've had the same translator ever since The Lightning Thief. She's awesome. She's very diligent. But she doesn't always understand, like, American slang. Very first book we worked on together, she called me and said, uh, Mr. Arden, what is a wedgie? <laughs> Well, it's sort of when, never mind. <laughs> but at this point, I knew I wanted to go back to Percy Jackson's world. I wasn't done with Camp Half-Blood. I didn't want to do the same thing all over again, because that would have been really boring for me. And I figure if the author gets bored, the books aren't going to be as good, and then you guys get bored, and that's no good. So I kept Percy and Annabeth and a lot of the gang, but I introduced a bunch of new heroes, such as Frank and Hazel. Piper and Jason. Yes, and of course, something that doesn't click. Everyone's favorite, Octavian. What? Okay, all right, Leo. I had a great time with the series, as you know, the first three have the Greeks and the Romans coming together and getting to know each other and going off on this huge adventure. And just this week, we had the fourth one come out, the House of Hades, and I hope you guys love that one. And it's done really well across the world. Festus the dragon is like really big. He's popular. I wanted to show you a few of the ways he is treated in different countries. There's the UK. Chinese, and I think the Germans really redeemed themselves. They did a great job on this, if I can get it to come up here. There, yeah. Not bad, not bad. 
And so what's happening now? Well, uh, as you heard earlier, the news is that my family and I just moved to Boston earlier. There's a picture of me in my new home office where I work every day, working on the new books. That's the view out my window. It's not bad. Yep. The family loves it on the East Coast. We're very happy to be over in this direction. There we are. That's me and Becky and Haley in the back and Patrick with the dog. Haley is going to college now um, in Boston, and he's studying, believe it or not, creative writing. He wants to write novels. So that's awesome. Patrick is going to high school there. He's my frontline editor. This guy with mechanics and punctuation and stuff, he's amazing. So if you see a lot of mistakes in House of Hades, that's because he didn't have time to read it this time. So that may be why. A few novels ago, I gave him my manuscript, and he said, sure, I'll read it for you, but will you, will you pay me for every mistake? <laughs> I was like, well, okay, I've read it, my editor's read it, so, I mean, how many are there going to be, two or three? I said, okay, sure. He said, how about 10 bucks per mistake? <laughs> Fine. He found 40 mistakes. <laughs> the kid's going to put himself through college editing my mistakes, and he's cool with that. <laughs> Our pets also keep us very busy. We didn't mean to adopt any of them. They were all rescue animals, but we have a very full house now. That's Slinky and Little Boy, and our third cat, who is Tribble. And, of course, the famous dog, Speedy. Yeah. And about the only thing we don't have is a rooster. Uh, so what's going on now? Well, I'm working on the fifth Heroes of Olympus book that'll wrap up the series. And if you want to know the title, it's in the back of, he of the House of Hades. So I don't want to give it away if you don't want to know, but you'll find out there. But even before that, I have a super secret project coming out. Next August, during the summer, I have written something called Percy Jackson's Greek Gods. Now, this is the original myths, as many as I could cram into a book, told from Percy's point of view. So you can imagine how snarky and sarcastic he gets about these gods. It was hysterical, writing them from Percy's point of view. That is going to be out in August. It's a 450-page novel. It's got full-color illustrations all the way through by John Rocco. It's really, really cool. I hope you guys like it. And this week is the first time that I can show you guys the cover. And there it is. And I can also tell you that after the Heroes of Olympus wraps up, the next project on my plate is the very first mythology I ever loved, the Norse myths. Loki, Odin, Thor, we're going to go with those guys in the modern world, do a Percy Jackson type spin on those stories. I am so looking forward to that. So that's the year after the house of Hades follow up. So that'd be like, what, 2015. I know that seems like forever, but yeah, it takes me a year to write every book. I know it's terrible. I spend a year writing it, laboring, toiling. It comes out like the next day. People are like, I read it. Where's the next one? Burp. I'm like, Sam, what can I tell you? But I don't want to leave without getting the questions that you guys wrote on those cards and seeing what you were interested in. So Mr. Ballinger has collected some of these. Thank you, sir. And let's see what's on your mind before we wrap things up and get you your books. If Apollo is the god of poetry, then why is he so bad at it in your book? <laughs> From Talia. Thank you, Talia. Yes. I, I think it's because I, I, I'm not really a poetry guy, and I always found poetry kind of silly. I mean, there's some poets I like. I'm not going to put down all poetry, but I just thought it would be funny if he was the god of poetry and he really, really stunk. When writing from the sevens perspective, which one do you like to write from the most? They all have advantages. Um, the hardest one, believe it or not, is Percy, because I'm so used to writing from his voice, first person, being inside his head. Writing from him, writing about him, third person, is tough. The easiest is probably Leo. Uh, <laughs> I mean... The dude just, I mean, it writes itself. 
Cecilia has a question. Why isn't Clarice and Grover in the Heroes of Olympus? In Percy Jackson, uh, they're really important. Yeah, great question also. Grover, uh, you will see briefly in the House of Hades. He makes an appearance. Clarice, they mention what she's doing. I mean, you'll see her kind of, sort of. But, I mean, the real reason is there are so many characters. The seven really take up so much of the story that it's hard to have every single character in every single book. So I kind of had to pick and choose. Otherwise, it would just be too much. But yeah, I like those guys too. Uh, do you feel any remorse putting your characters in grave danger? <laughs> Well, I mean, the thing is, I mean, if they were never in danger, that'd be really boring, you know? It's like, then suddenly Percy got up and ate cereal. <laughs> he went to school and nothing happened. Went home and went to bed. <laughs> Chapter 2, Tuesday. <laughs> now, I mean, that would be boring. So, of course it's hard on the demigods, but, you know, Percy did warn you on page one of The Lightning Thief, hey, my life is tough. <laughs> what is your favorite book that you did not write? Well, I mean, I'd have to go with The Lord of the Rings just because it was so important to me, but I like all kinds of writing. I read all kinds of middle grade fantasy. What do you feel about fan art or fan fiction, and has it ever inspired you? I'm aware of fan fiction. I never, never read it. I mean, there's a couple of reasons. I mean, I think, hey, that's fine. You're doing it for yourself. You're just having fun. Great. I mean, I, I wrote a lot of stuff when I was young that sounded just like The Lord of the Rings, and that was kind of how I learned to write. Um, but I don't ever read it because I don't want anybody ever coming back to me and saying, hey, you got that idea for me. And the other thing is, it's just a little bit weird for me to watch other people writing about my characters. It's kind of like watching somebody put on my clothes, you know, and kind of try to walk around and pretend to be me. It's just weird. Uh, fan art is great. I like the fan art. Is your son going to write another book? Well, he did a story in the Demigod Diaries for me, which was called Son of Magic, because I figured it was only fair. He was writing stuff, and he inspired Percy Jackson. So we did a story about a son of Hecate. He says that someday he might might write about Percy Jackson's world. I don't know. We'll see what he comes up with in his creative writing classes. Okay, question. I am very dyslexic, and I know your son is dyslexic. Do you make sure your books are audible audiobooks or text-to-speech enabled on Kindle on purpose, or do your publishers just do it? I, I know that audiobooks work so well for a lot of people, and I try to make sure that they're always available. I know that that's really important to the publisher, too. I mean, occasionally there's, you know, mix-ups, and I don't know how it all works. They have to you know, negotiate the rights with Amazon or Kindle or Nook or whoever it is or whatever. So I don't really know the ins and outs of it, but yeah, I, I agree that the audio is really good. Strangely, though, I've never listened to the audio of my own books. Again, it's sort of like fan fiction. It just freaks me out to hear somebody else reading my stuff. I just, I, I can't, I can't do it. Have you ever, wait, after having many near-death experiences with all of my favorite characters, nervous laughter, <laughs> which character's death would cause you the most emotional trauma? This is a question from Rebecca Tiger and Frothy? Frankie? Frankie, sorry, Frankie, Frankie, sorry, sorry. Um, I would be devastated if any of the characters died. Um, now, I do, I mean, there are some deaths in the series. You know that if you read the first Percy Jackson series. And the reason there are some is that if no one ever died uh, that was on the good side, that really, even for a fantasy, wouldn't be realistic. And it wouldn't have any kind of danger, threat. Uh, but I don't believe, generally speaking, in killing off my main characters, because that would really stink. <laughs> How does it feel making small children cry with your cliffhangers? It warms my heart, thank you. And final question from Anna in sixth grade. What are the ancient stones Gaia and her allies and minions talked about in the Mark of Athena? And do they exist in Greek mythology? Um, they're not like a particular item from Greek mythology. Um, they, I can't really say more than that without giving away too much about the fifth book. But there is a reference that blood shall be spilt on the ancient stones. Now, it's not too much of a 
spoiler, really, but I can't really tell you anything other than that. But I think it'll make sense to you when you read book five, which is a very cruel way to end. But thank you guys so much for coming out tonight, and I hope you like book four. Thank you, guys.